the Republic Day Parade, uh, if you remember the, the bit that many of us liked as, as children was when the state sort of came on display, <coughs> was also a way of sort of demonstrating this certain kind of, of diversity. So uh, instead of pushing a, a one size fits all, one language, one national dress, uh, one way of being Indian, there were various performances that showed there were multiple ways of being Indian. I think there was a lot of surprise, uh, uh, agreeable surprise, at the, the nature of the protest that took place a few years ago, uh, where there was a kind of collective invocation of the preamble and collective acts of reading. Uh, and while the scale and the focus of the preambles was, was unusual, um, I'd like to remind everyone that um, the Constitution has long been a site of uh, uh, both protest and of hope. Um, right from the days of uh, its actual drafting and writing. Um, I'm working on a, a new book project with a uh, co-author on Ikhani, and we're looking at um, claims made in the 1940s and 50s around the constitution. And it's quite clear that groups across India, um, including sort of um, tribals living um, deep in the uh, interiors of places like uh, but, uh, but, uh, Bastar and, and Jharkhand, people living in the Northeast, uh, people in towns and villages were actively engaged uh, and thinking about the process of constitution making. And they saw this as something that would affect their lives um, in, the, in the future. And um, right from uh, the early processes of, 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 of constitution writing in Delhi and, and consultations around the country, uh, individuals and groups sort of reached out uh, to sort of uh, push for uh, their vision uh, into the constitution. So the constitution operated both as a sword uh, and a shield, um, a sword to advance certain kinds of claims. Uh, these could be claims as minorities, um, the sort of uh, push by um, uh, Dalit groups to ensure that untouchability was abolished. Uh, these also became kind of sought to advance claims later on, claims that weren't originally there in the constitutional text, and perhaps most clearly uh, campaigns like the right to employment uh, or the right to food, which began as social movements, um, then entered the courtrooms, and then took a kind of legislative form uh, with Narega and uh, uh, the right to food uh, provisions. Uh, more conventionally, it also began to be used as a shield to protect certain kinds of interest. And we see this, um, you know, again, right from the 1940s, uh, when civil liberties groups started to use provision of the draft constitution to critique acts of the Congress government just after independence. So even before the constitution came into force, there was a kind of constitutional framework that was being used to challenge uh, and, and argue against the government. It, it takes more unusual forms uh, when we see um, uh, groups that are often, um, you know, they don't have a, a electoral voice. Um, they find themselves marginalized the electoral space. Uh, they often find themselves turning to the constitution as a kind of form of social contract. Um, so, for example, the Darbar Mahila uh, Swamvaya Committee, uh, one of India's largest organizations of sex workers, um, sort of gives its members a pamphlet with uh, Article 19 um, framing their claims as, as a part of right to um, uh, livelihood uh, very, very firmly. Or uh, over the years, artists and writers have often turned to Article 19 to sort of um, uh, make their assertions to protect uh, uh, freedom of speech and expression. Uh, there have, of course, been attempts to alter and change the constitution, and it's striking that in the post-emergency elections, one of the major planks of the Janta Party was to uh, restore the constitution to its original uh, text and its original intent, and the overwhelming majority the Janta Party got showed there was a kind of political consensus around that. Um, there have been a couple of attempts, one with the Swaran Singh Committee under Mrs. Gandhi and one under the Vajpayee government to radically rewrite or restructure the constitution. And in both cases, they, they got stern pushback from um, both political parties and civil society, and the projects were eventually dropped. Um, what I want to point out is that, therefore, the constitution being a site of protest or political uh, 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 mobilization is not new. Uh, the examples you gave even of protests which lead to burning the constitution and the other examples are of um, during the anti-Hindi movement in, in the south, there were some examples of people burning the official language provisions. Those are also part of this rich history of protest and the fact that many of those who protested by denying or burning the constitution actually turned to it. Uh, is a sign of constitutional resilience. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes is, you know, at the time of uh, independence, the, the Communist Party of India um, and uh, several of the parties on the right were very critical of the constitutional text, arguing that it was 
um, you know, not authentic or, 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 or a bourgeois document. But one of the first cases the Indian Supreme Court heard was a case involving the rights of a, uh, a Communist Party member who had been accused uh, of um, uh, unprevented detention, and he was being defended by the president of the Hindu Mahasabha. So it, it really became a platform where different interests could come in. Um, so I, I think the, the protests that happened a couple of years ago and continuing conversations show that there's a deep resilience that the constitution carries in public imagination. And this resilience is more than the exact textual uh, legalistic reading of the document. And I think that's why it's striking that the protests that took place didn't turn to the article on equality or didn't turn to say the article on the due process, but really focused on the preamble, which conveyed uh, for the people reading it, a certain kind of spirit behind the making of the Indian Republic and, and a spirit that guided them as um, a, a spirit that guided the compact of citizens with this Republic. Uh, a couple of things one needs to unpack here. Uh, the first, of course, is, you know, what do we mean by secularism? And um, a lot of people, uh, even those who are, uh, you know, quite well informed, often read this as a kind of classical liberal definition, which is separation of religion from political space. Um, and a practice that has almost never been followed in, in India or indeed much of the world, even in places that would describe themselves as secular. This is a sort of very European understanding of secularism. Um, in India, secularism, especially in the 1920s and 30s, came to mean something very specific and was often in opposition to the idea of communalism, which by itself is, is not a negative term at all. It just means that um, the, the kind of unit of political activity is the community. So secularism, if communalism meant that one's political interests were defined by the community they belonged to, uh, a position taken by parties across the board from the Muslim League to the Hindu Mahasabha, secularism meant something different. Uh, it meant an idea that multiple communities could have shared political interests. Um, the term secularism formally enters the constitution only during the emergency, and much is made of this fact, right? Uh, uh, so a couple of things to keep in mind. Firstly, that uh, many of the emergency amendments were actually erased, uh, written back. Uh, and the term secularism and also the phrase uh, unity and integrity of India, which are part of the preamble, uh, were additions during the emergency, but the Janta Party chose not to remove them, which shows a kind of shared political consensus around the value of secularism as it was understood. Uh, so secondly, uh, I mean, it's not as if at the time of drafting, uh, while the term might not have been present, and Ambedkar says this in the context of both secularism and socialism, he says, we don't need to have the specific term. The provisions of the constitution make it quite clear what the state stands for. So the state, uh, the constitution made it quite clear that, that India would have uh, no discrimination on the grounds of religion. It accommodated yeah. a flexible idea of equality. So it said it, nothing prevented the state for making special provisions uh, to create substantive equality for groups that were systematically disenfranchised. Um, it protected religious freedom, but it also curbed religious freedom on the grounds of um, public order, health, morality, etc. Um, so if we look at the kind of conversation at the time of uh, uh, constitution making, it, it's striking how many letters the assembly gets from um, orthodox uh, Hindu and Muslim groups um, saying things like uh, freedom of religion and secularism means untouchability cannot be abolished or that uh, Hindu law, Muslim law cannot be interfered with. Uh, but it was quite clear uh, to the members of the assembly that the kind of promise of um, uh, secular citizenship meant that in certain, certain ways, interests of um, uh, religions could be curbed uh, to, to lead to sort of social advancement. So the idea of secularism in India has, has, has not been a kind of dramatic separation of church and state, but the idea that the state stands equidistant from all religions and the state will intervene in religious matters when uh, certain other values uh, uh, become strong. Um, I think there's been a lot of documentation about uh, uh, ways in which uh, inclusiveness um, um, might have changed this political practice, um, but this has not led to, and, 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 and the Supreme Court has multiple times uh, ruled that secularism is part of India's constitutional basic structure. So if, um, uh, right. at least right. legally and politically, if there are uh, at attempted dramatic changes to uh, um, state practice and citizenship, 
um, the court should and ought to give uh, 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 give these issues a hearing and, and uphold the meaning of, of secularism as is defined uh, by the constitution. Uh, but what is also clear is that the constitution doesn't, uh, it, it's a text, it, it, it is only as effective um, as those, uh, as to the extent that is defended both by institutions um, like judges and politicians, but also by civil and political society, that is political parties and society groups. So unless these values are, are talked about, uh, inculcated and defended, um, these, these, these ideas on paper uh, have little meaning. Uh, but what gives me hope is that uh, in the Indian context, um, there's a long history of defending many of these values, um, both on the court um, and on the electoral battlefield and even on the streets. The Indian constitution has a federal structure with a unitary bias. Uh, and it's important to understand why there's a unitary bias. So in 1946, um, the sort of drafters of the constitution were dealing with um, uh, the fact of partition and also the challenges of integrating numerous territories which had never been under a writ of a government that was based in Delhi. So there were there was deep concerns of separation and disappearance tendencies. Um, secondly, there was also a concern that um, for those who were were part of the first Indian independent government, these range from you know uh, Nehru uh, to Ambedkar. Uh, uh, the idea was that independence by itself would not have any meaning unless it led to social and economic transformation, and the belief was that one could only do this transformation through a strong central government, which could draw funds from across the country and also plan for the whole country. Um, and one could argue that in the 1940s and 50s, um, these provisions were necessary. They, they made sense um, given the kind of political climate of the time. Uh, and in fact, the success of, of, of India's democracy, the longevity of its state structure has been that it was able to uh, uh, accommodate dissent uh, and, 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 and bring in um, you know, a, a range of people and territories that had never been accustomed to uh, a certain kind of centralized rule. Um, as you rightly say, uh, um, in, in, the, in, in the early years, uh, every time there's been a party which is overwhelming majority, there has been a tendency to uh, govern from the center and, and not from the region. Um, I don't think this happens just when there is a national party ruling. So the early years of the Congress party right after the 1960s and um, the BJP governments in the late 90s and the early 2000s were primarily federally oriented parties. They had strong uh, uh, state, uh, uh, state units. Uh, and they had strong regional leaders. So even though they were national parties, they were guided by uh, local regional politics and regional identities. Um, there's obviously been a change uh, which is tied to political funding, um, the nature of political parties that has turned, uh, say the Congress in the 70s and 80s uh, and the BJP today more centralized uh, than they were in the past. And this has also led to a lot of decision making being, being done at the center rather than at the regional level. Um, this is this is uh, again a, a test of, of of how a polity is. So in the past, the strong unitary polity led by the Congress was uh, weakened with the rise of regional parties across the country. We had about two decades of coalition governments in the 90s, where uh, even though Indian institutions were centralized, a lot of decision making became shared and accommodative. Um, and contrary to the ideas that these would lead to, you know weak governments, uh, we now know that uh, many of these coalition governments of the 90s, including the short-lived United Front or the Vajpayee governments, actually were able to initiate significant uh, economic um, uh, and foreign policy and social and social changes. Even in the days where um, uh, uh, we had strong centralized government, there was always a policy of accommodating the needs of specific regions. And, and one example of this is um, if you look at um, the articles following Article 370, so almost all um, um, sort of uh, regions of India from Sikkim to the Northeast to districts in Maharashtra have special provisions that protect certain kinds of interests, be it about um, uh, the ability of outsiders to buy land in those provinces or in places like Sikkim, the fact that uh, Buddhist monks and nuns get special representation legislatures. So, so India was never a one size fits all model and attempts to do that have, uh, have, have, have have led to political uh, political challenges. Uh, one of the successes of Indian federalism, particularly in the Northeast, has been ways in which 
claims that existed around 1946 and were brushed away were later accommodated through the formation of new states. And I think only recently we celebrated um, the anniversary of the birth of several new states uh, uh, in the Northeast. There's also been a constant move towards decentralization. So this can be seen either through uh, the Panchayati reforms and the amendments in the early 90s. So there was a conscious effort to give uh, the lowest rung of governance a constitutional structure. Also through the emergence of statehood or statehood movements in what were earlier considered union territories. Um, so as we all know, there has been some, uh, uh, excuse me, some recent changes uh, uh, in that. Um, uh, one has to see, again, to what extent um, the earlier constitutional ideas will be upheld. It's quite clear that um, many political parties um, see these transformations as, as violating the federal idea of India. There are several court cases in the mix that are still to decide uh, on questions of federalism, and one hopes the Supreme Court will express its opinions clearly. Uh, so this remains uh, this remains a, 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 a sort of a battle of values and ideas. Um, but there, there is strong precedent and there are strong clauses in the constitution that give strength to those who look to have a more decentralized and a more federal India. And it's also quite clear uh, to the extent that one, one, one follows um, commentators on economics and, 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 and social change, that maybe in the 50s, centralized growth and centralized transformation were the tools that were needed. But increasingly, it's clear that sometimes growth and social change happens better through decentralized movement and decentralized funding. And, and, and one hopes that these forces will also push uh, uh, for changes and, and see the centralization as more a kind of aberration in the larger trajectory of Indian decentralization than a kind of permanent U-turn. So uh, again, as my colleague Arnish Shani have been working on this project, it's quite clear that you know um, a third of Indian um, territory in 1947 was governed by um, these sort of semi-autonomous princely states, um, many of whom had their own constitutions, their flags, um, their elements of state sovereignty. And, and the success of the making of India's republic, um, the role played by people like um, uh, Nehru, VP Menon, Sardar Patel, uh, in, in sort of uh, tying these regions together was a remarkable one. And, and one of the factors that allowed them to bring these regions in relatively bloodlessly was to assure them that their regional identities um, would be maintained. Um, so in the early years, uh, you know, before the new states of Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh were made, um, uh, there were a bunch of these um, uh, states that were governed by uh, instead of governors by Raj Pramukh, so leaders of the old royal families, as democratic politics sort of grew, they were slowly moved out. Um, so it's through the process that, uh, uh, particularly when, when linguistic states were being formed, that in certain places, um, the, the Indian government agreed to recognize the existence of, uh, uh, say, regional state flags or, or, or state songs. Uh, I think Kashmir is uh, was perhaps the only territory that had its own constitution that was finally sort of accepted. Um, and the question remains as to what the impact of um, the last set of amendments have on the Jammu and Kashmir constitution. It's, it's being heard by the Supreme Court. Um, um, and, and in many places, the existence of these other forms of sovereignty, say celebrating Karnataka Rajyotsava or having a, a separate flag or a state song would be seen as a challenge to national identity. But uh, what had worked for a long time was that these were not seen as uh, challenges, but really multiple identities that people, people held. So you could be a proud uh, 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 Kanadiga, you know, with celebrating your Rajyotsava day, but you're also, uh, this is no disrespect to the larger symbols of, 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 of India. And the Republic Day Parade, uh, if you remember the, the bit that many of us liked as, as children was when the state sort of came on display, <coughs> was also a way of sort of demonstrating this certain kind of, of diversity. So uh, instead of pushing a, a one size fits all, one language, one national dress, uh, one way of being Indian, there were various performances that showed there were multiple ways of being Indian. Um, uh, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, th this allowed for uh, a, a certain kind of diversity, both at a uh, kind of cultural level, but also at an institutional level uh, to exist. Um, uh, so as and when, um, you know, um, uh, political movements sort of engage with the state for, for more decentralization, for new states, uh, these are all things that are in the mix. Um, that exists to be sort of navigated. Um, 
So uh, one can imagine that when new states are being formed, like Telangana or, 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 or the other state movements, uh, they could adopt sort of local, local state symbols and state regions. Uh, but um, uh, as long as they're allowed to choose both, um, uh, pushing one with the exclusion of the other uh, usually leads to a, a kind of unsustainable conflict, as we've seen uh, in our neighboring countries, uh, in Pakistan and in Sri Lanka. And, and those are parts that it would, uh, you know, we have, we have navigated right. So far, but uh, I might yeah. not go down. The second question you asked was about um, about 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 youth uh, and the relative young age of the population. I, and I've been thinking about this um, in recent years, uh, in recent times. And I think um, you know I, I I won't answer the the specific question, which is more to do with sort of economic modeling. But um, there is something um, called institutional and cultural memories. There are generations of Indians who remember uh, ways in which uh, the state uh, dealt with the sand or the state sort of showcases diversity in the 70s and the 80s and 90s. Um, they can see the changes that took place, um, uh, you know, from the, the late days of the Congress majorities in the 80s through the kind of coalition comes of 90s, 2000s. Uh, but we're at a time where uh, increasingly the majority of the population would have no memory uh, of that period. So all that they would have seen is, is, is what would have happened over the last uh, 15, 16 years, um, which is, uh, uh, so I, I think that, 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 that that's why it's important um, uh, for multiple channels uh, to sort of uh, talk about the history of the Republic um, and, and not talk about it didactically. There's not, not necessarily one definitive story that everyone has to accept, uh, but, but to really think and debate uh, about decisions taken, um, and about how uh, the state changed from uh, a kind of very loose idea of nationality um, and, and sovereignty in the, in the 40s to what it has become today and what allowed that to become possible. So um, to sort of go back to the early part of the constitution, uh, the constitution allows for the expression of dissent, but by yeah. using the constitution to express dissent, the dissenters also become a part of, uh, uh, of the Indian compact, right? So uh, by choosing to use the constitution, uh, you become in some ways one with the constitution. And, and, and if constitutional dissent gets prescribed, um, um, that that actually uh, is in many ways a greater threat to the unity of India than expressing dissent through constitutional means. 